Hi there, my name is Aaron Lanchman. I'm a professor of electrical and computer engineering at Georgia Tech. And today I want to talk about how information is represented in analog systems. Particularly analog electrical signals. Suppose that I have two systems that I want to have talk to each other. And the output of one system is characterized by a voltage. And this is a voltage measured with respect to ground. And I'm going to put a resistance in series with it so that this forms a Thevenin equivalent. Now, this could also be some sort of generic impedance that has capacitive or inductive elements. But for the purposes of today's discussion, I'll just stick with this being a resistor. And I'll call this RO. So this may characterize various circuit elements further upstream in the circuit. It may include some resistance that we've put in deliberately as some sort of short circuit protection. Whatever it is, it's usually something that we want to keep relatively small because the way we're going to think about the circuit that receives this is that ideally I just have some sort of magic measurement device that measure voltages, again, relative to some ground. Ideally, this would be an infinite input impedance but I'm going to assume that this is actually some resistance Ri. Again, it could have some sort of capacitance, it could have some sort of inductance, it could be a general impedance, but for the purposes of today, I'm just gonna assume that it's just some resistance. So here's the question. What is the actual voltage at the input going to be? So via the voltage divider property, the actual voltage that this circuit will see is going to be equal to whatever my output voltage is times Ri over RO plus Ri. So ideally, we would like to have our input impedance be a lot bigger than our output impedance so that this divider is approximately 1 and the voltage that the circuit sees at the input is the actual output voltage. Depending on this particular circuit, this might be an actual resistor that we choose, or this may represent a Thevenin resistance of the input of the circuit, so it's encapsulating a lot of complicated things. And on this side of the circuit, there may be all sorts of crazy nonlinear stuff. On this side over here inside this circuit, there may be all sorts of crazy nonlinear stuff going on. But for the purposes of interfacing these circuits together, this is the way we think about it. The information is contained in this voltage signal. Let me make that a better looking ground symbol. How about that? That's one way to communicate information between different analog circuits. Now, these two circuits, they could be, say, different modules in a modular synthesizer where you're patching the output of an oscillator to the input of a filter. They could involve control systems and actuators talking to each other, separated by significant distances in, say, a manufacturing plant. This could model wired communications going for several miles across a city. Or these could be integrated circuits on a PCB. Or these could involve sub-circuits in an integrated circuit, and we're using this kind of abstraction to try to think about how that integrated circuit operates by breaking it up into easy to understand components and then assembling their various behaviors. Now, if we're talking about big physical boxes that you're connecting together with cables by grabbing a cable and plugging it into one jack on one box and plugging the other end of the cable into a jack on the other box, then you're probably connecting things using voltages to carry the information. But we can also use currents to carry information. Now, of course, there's always relationships between currents and voltages. So this isn't really that exciting, but there's some points I want to make here. So here, RO is our output resistance. I'm trying to say O instead of zero or not because O here is standing for output. And then we have a current source here, and I'll call that IO for I output. And that current's going to flow out of here. The current, I'll imagine, is going through this input impedance here. And then kind of imagine that you have an ammeter here. Usually, I'll indicate this kind of thing by just putting an arrow, a little arrow kind of thing along the wire there, the schematic wire. 
But here, imagine this is kind of an ammeter. And what this ammeter is doing, it's measuring the current going this direction. And now I'm going to quite confusingly call this II. You know what? Maybe I should make all of this out. Just make this really specific. Let's make this in, 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 in. And we'll make this out, in. <laughs> Not in. This is out. This is in. This is in. This is out. And let's make this out. And this is out. And this is in. All right. I like that better. Let's do that. Notice everything's referenced to a ground here. If you've mostly been looking at textbooks, you'll probably be used to seeing an explicit connection like this. But no real schematics are drawn that way in real life. OK, so what current does the other box here I should draw in my box? Box, 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 box. The line here represents the connection between these two components that we're trying to transfer information in between. So what is the current that the second box actually perceives? Well, it's going to be this output current split through this current divider. And now I have to be careful with the way I write this. Because in most of the work I do, I wind up using voltage division instead of current division. So I'll often mess this up. So I've got the sum of the resistances in the denominator. And then for a current divider, you put down the resistance that the current isn't flowing through. So here I'm going to put R out in the numerator. And now I'm going to ask, how would I want to set this up if I don't want to lose current? Well, I will be able to get this to be pretty close to the output if, in this case, the output resistance is much bigger than the input resistance. And again, these could be generic impedances if you have capacitive or inductive effects, in which case we would use Z instead of R. So if we're connecting systems using current, we would like R out to be big and Rn to be small, so the current won't want to go down this branch, but will want to go down this branch. And in the case of connecting with voltages, we would like R out to be small and Rn to be big. So there's not really a lot of current flowing through here, and you pretty much see all of this voltage over here dropping across here, because you're not getting a lot of voltage dropping across that R out. Now, if these conditions here don't hold, that's not a showstopper. You just have to realize that you need to include these effects when you're calculating the behavior of the system. In particular, if you have a series of components that you're used to just drawing as a series of block diagrams, maybe this is a high pass filter, maybe this is a low pass filter, whatever, whatever, dot, 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 and you're building some filters, well, you have to be careful with that. Because if it's a circuit, if these aren't just magical block diagrams on a piece of paper, you can wind up with this effect where systems further down the line load down systems that come before it. And you just have to remember to include these effects if you need to. And now we can ask questions like, what kind of single input, single output systems could we have? Suppose I were to take my output structure here and copy and paste it and squoosh it over here. Squoosh, 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 squoosh. So what do I have here? I have a system that takes a voltage as an input and provides a voltage as an output. So here's a voltage input and a voltage output system. If I think about what the gain of the system is, and the gain could be less than one, that gain is unitless. Similarly, let's grab this output current structure and squoosh it over here. OK, we have squooshed it. And just like up here, if I want to characterize the input and output relationship of the system, I have a current going out that's related to the current going in by some factor, and this factor is also unitless. So I have a current gain here, or I have a voltage gain up here. But now let me swap this around. I'm going to grab this output structure here, scoosh it down here, and let's scoosh this up here, scoosh my input structures closer, and scoosh this guy over here. Let's clean this junk out here. And let's connect the dots here. Do, 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 I now have two other kinds of systems. In this one, the output is a current, but the input is a voltage. And 
In this one, the output is a voltage and the input is a current. So the factor here, whatever it is, is in units of one over ohms. So I like to use an upside down omega for that and call those mos. And then down here, we have a factor that's in the units of ohms. So down here, we have a trans resistance relationship. And up here, we have a trans conductance relationship. So remember, what we're describing with these equations here is whatever is happening inside the rest of the circuit that I'm not drawing in. So there's all sorts of crazy stuff going on. And for that matter, this isn't really something that you should take literally. This is all part of an overall description of how the circuit behaves. What R in and R out are defining is the way that the rest of the world sees and interfaces with the inputs and outputs. Another thing that I should mention is I've written these equations as linear equations, but you can make appropriate modifications to describe circuits that are nonlinear, that may be taking squares or cube roots or something.